three live for a new episode of Electric Podcast. I am Fred Lambert, your host, and as usual, I'm joined by Seth Wintra. How are you doing this week, Seth? I'm good. Was it? Was that some music back there? <laughs> yeah, we're just hopping the production value at the Electric Podcast <laughs> through the roof. Um, all right, so let's jump in because we have plenty of news to discuss this week. As usual, we're going to start with some Tesla news, but then we have plenty to talk about non-Tesla EV-wise because there was a bunch of EV startups earnings this week. It was like the week for that. Uh, so we're going to get into that. But first off, some um, Tesla Model 3 refresh news that came out just yesterday. And um, it's not giant, to be honest, but like this is the kind of thing that uh, every little bit of, uh, of news that we get that people like to, uh, to know. Let me, um, I'm getting a bunch of notification for some reason. Let me just close that away. All right, we're good. Uh, so yeah, this uh, Model 3 was spotted at the Fremont factory on the test track. Thanks to um, Twitter user, not Twitter, TikTok user, Hector696969. Um, and uh, there's not much we can see because, again, it's a Model 3 that was um, uh, covered from the front bumper and the, the back. So not much to see from the outside. But at one point, the door is open and we can see inside. And they are also covered completely the inside, which would indicate that the um, dash has been updated. Otherwise, they wouldn't really hide it. Uh, the door, too, has uh, either a cover on it or the panel is, like, detached from the door. It's not clear. Um, but that could indicate another update there. The only thing that is not covered that we can confirm is new is the steering wheel. So we do have a brand-new steering wheel. And uh, it looks closer to the Model S and X steering wheel, which makes sense since it's the most recent one that's been updated. Uh, obviously, the round steering wheel on the Model S and X, not the yoke. It uh, doesn't appear to be any visible stock. So yeah. that might indicate that Tesla is sticking to that strategy and the stock are completely going away. Though, I mean, again, hard to tell from this picture, but it doesn't look like there's a ton of space for these first touch buttons on there. But again, not the best picture to, to, to see. Uh, looks like there's still scrolls. like So the scrolls are still there in the middle. But that's about all we can uh, get from that picture so far. And the rest of the, you know, the part that Tesla's not covering up, that's all the same, right? I, mean, I guess it looks a little new, maybe with the, the mat, but I guess that's all typical stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's really not much we can we can tell. Uh, some people on Reddit found that like, from the, the video, you can see, it appears that the driver is switching gears from the side of the the screen like you do in the Model S and X, on the new Model S and X. But again, that would just point to the stock not being there. So there's really not much. Uh, some people claim, oh, it looks like there might be uh, an instrument cluster behind the wheel, but that might just be the, the way that the, the, the cover... The cover is like falling on top of it. Really, not much we can tell from it. Is the door covered? Yeah, it's not. It, it's either covered or the door panel is like sticking out, one or the other. But either way, we can tell. Maybe a new door as well. Yeah, yeah, maybe. All right. This week was the uh, groundbreaking ceremony for the Tesla lithium refinery in um, in Corpus, well, outside of Corpus Christi, Texas. Uh, we have um, not a ton of new information about it. Uh, we have a render, so it looks pretty cool. You have a full render of the of the facility here that's going to be uh, separated in a bunch of different buildings. Uh, Elon did confirm that uh, they plan to produce enough lithium hydroxide to support the production for a million electric vehicles a year. So that gives us some kind of capacity for the for, for the plant. Uh, previously, we've heard of $365 million investment, 165 full-time jobs, plus another 250 during the construction phase. So originally, they were supposed to have like a pretty quick timeline on this, but now it's been delayed a bit. Uh, what's the new timeline I'm looking for? Okay, so uh, construction to be finished sometime next year and uh, production in 2025. So this is still... Uh, it's a, it's a quick project, but maybe not on the timeline that we're used to from Tesla. Um, that might be because uh, the process that they're going to use to um, process really the, the, the lithium uh, ore is, uh, is a new one. It's not something that's been done before. So that might explain 
the DLA, like they need to validate that process before they reach any kind of volume production from it. But they say that it's going to be the, uh, it's going to produce more lithium hydroxide than any other refinery in North America or all of them combined, really. Which is not saying much because there's not that much <laughs> lithium being refined right now. And around that time that this thing is going to be online, there's going to be some bigger one, a big one in North Carolina, of course, with uh, P uh, Piedmont uh, lithium. But that's Tesla is also partnering with them, so <laughs> they are securing that too. And uh, then there's Livent uh, with Nemaska lithium in, right next where I live here in Quebec. And that's also, I think, production in 2024, 2025, and that's a big one too. Doesn't seem that big that uh, you know you can yeah. build a million cars with that. It's hard to tell though with that render, like a bunch of different buildings. Yeah. One thing that kind of stole the show from the groundbreaking ceremony is the cyber truck that Tesla brought to the event. Why did it steal the show? Because it had a new accessory on it that seems like uh, might be something that made it that could make it to production. It's a, a sort of a tool rack that fits right on the bed of the truck. And the design of it looks like it's something a little bit like refined. It's not necessarily something that they just put together for the event. It might actually be um, some kind of, of a product that Tesla is going to release. And just something that can make the roof flat so that uh, you can also attach some more common accessories like a baggage carrier or a, uh, a bed a tent or something like that that you can put on top. Um, so it, it it's it's an accessory that can probably enable other accessories too. I was gonna. I thought you were gonna say the the Giga Wiper was the new. Uh... <laughs> yeah, where, where did you say you heard that term like Giga Wiper? That's, I don't uh, know. People probably Reddit or something. Yeah, doesn't look too bad on this one. Yeah, as long as they keep the light off of it, <laughs> it's yeah. okay. Um, it's weird. Why don't <clears throat> why didn't they make that thing flat? It seems like it's uh, pointed backwards still. Like the uh, the uh, tool carrier or whatever. Like, is that supposed to be flat? Like, uh... I, I think it might be flat. It might be the the angle. Or, or you mean from the from the inside? It, it's a little bit. No, There's from the angle? top. Like, if you were putting stuff on top of it, I think it. it I think it's backwards? flat. Hmm. Yeah, Let's... this one looks flat. I think it might just be the angle. Yeah. No, I think that would be the goal to make it flat so that you can strap other things on top of it. Uh, there was a big test. Well, big. Uh, there was a there was a <laughs> full self-driving beta update this week. We actually talked a bit about it last week because Elon was hyping it up, saying that it was going to be a big one and that it's even going to be. Um, it, sh it could have been V12, FSD beta V12, but they are reserving that for this end-to-end -end AI um, system that would replace the, the... The AI will not just be for the perception part of driving, but it will also be for the decision-making part of driving. So it's saying that that's going to come to Tesla FSD beta at some point this year. In the meantime, we get V11.4, uh, which he claimed would still had some major improvements. Uh, we have the release notes right now on the website if you want to check it. But to be honest, from the release note, it doesn't look like that big of an update. Some improvement on phantom braking on the highway. Uh, some, obviously, that's a big deal. But they've been saying that like every single update, honestly. And I haven't seen that much of a difference. So a lot of it is like a little incremental improvement to uh, the capacity of uh, FSD beta. I haven't got it myself just yet. I think it's mainly for like the OG. Um, it's not just internally right now. So they are outside of Tesla. Better Tesla getting it, but more of like the early ones, not uh, as not propagated that much just yet. I think I'm going to do a video on this one once it comes out, I guess, since it's going to be basically a year since I got my first update of FSD beta. So see how much improvement you get over a year. Uh, I've used it a little bit, the 0.3 over the last few weeks and like i said i was pleasantly surprised that at least it's not uh, any kind of significant regression from the autopilot stack but at the same time it's not anything that's impressing me uh, on outside of highway driving uh 
big milestone for Gigafactory text. Like this little jumping thing is so annoying. I cannot click on it. Um, I don't know what it does that. It just does that when we're streaming. So it's really, it's the StreamYard update, the StreamYard or something that's doing that. Um, milestone, 5,000 milliwatts a week. So that's a big one. And, and it happened quite fast because, well, it happened behind Giga Factory Berlin, but in terms of like the, the ramp up, like it was 2,000 in December, 4,000 in April, and now we're in May, it's already 5,000 units. And obviously the comparison with Berlin is not the best one because Berlin is producing, is not producing it with two different architecture, the structural battery pack architecture and the one with the, the old one with the 2170 cells. Um, that said, we don't know that 5,000 units, units a week has been achieved in what way has it been achieved with mostly 2170 or is it because of the ramp up of the 4680 in the structural battery pack? We don't know the mix, so that would be nice, but Tesla doesn't release that. Uh, either way, it's, a, it's good news for Tesla because now they have both uh, Berlin and Gear Factory in Texas at uh, what the milestone that they normally claim achieve mass production. And that's going to help them with their gross margin because the factories until now have both been underutilized and that uh, affects your gross margin when you're not utilizing a full factory at its full capacity. Or at least these production lines are full capacity because obviously the factories are still going to grow, but they're expected to grow with new production lines. In terms of uh, Gear Factory Texas, we know Cybertruck is, is the next thing to come out of it. In Berlin, it's not clear just yet what they're working on uh, past Model Y. Yeah, quarter million a year run rate, though. That's pretty impressive for yeah, how, no, how young they are. Year. And yeah, they're building quite a uh, quite a footprint there, really. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, this came out today. Uh, Tesla has surprised a lot of people. They uh, announced that they won't be producing the new Model S and new Model X in the right-hand drive configuration, even though they've been selling it for the past two years without <laughs> delivering it and uh, now they are now they are announcing that it's just not coming at all so a bunch of people woke up this morning with an email saying that their order has been canceled and they're going to be reimbursed uh, some of them again like two years in the waiting they were waiting for that um in in some markets like australia thailand uh singapore uh, the they are not even going to sell the mall s anymore so the mall s is is done there um, in other markets, like in the UK and in Japan, they're still going to sell the Model S or at least inventory Model S from, but the left-hand drive. So they're going to try to deliver left-hand drive vehicles to, um, uh, I, I'm going to have to stop this. It's just like driving me nuts. <laughs> um, I'll add it so, back again. um, yeah, so, so they're going to. Deliver, but it's only inventory vehicles as I'm seeing right now. So Tesla sent out an email. is like, if you still want a Model S, we cancel your order, but you can look at the inventory. And the inventory, in terms of the UK, it's already in the UK. So my theory on this right now is like, we knew that Tesla was having issues selling Model S and X. Uh, last quarter, there was a big inventory of Model S and X left in the US or, or well, worldwide if you, uh, when they released their uh, production and delivery number uh, up until... Uh, April, Model S and X was like a, a big part of the inventory on end. Uh, Tesla said because it was in transit. And normally when Tesla says that, it's like it's, it's in transit to customers who bought it. But now what we're understanding is like it might have been in transit to the UK and maybe Japan too. Uh, and to sell them as left-hand drive in those markets. There's a 2,000 well, 2, uh, pounds, I guess, uh, in the UK. Um, discount for those. So it would be interesting to see if it sells or not. Uh, I would assume it would because there was a lot of pent-up demand. But it's very interesting that Tesla is like giving up on Model S and X in those markets now. Yeah, it seems like a big deal. And uh, actually expecting uh, those markets to accept left-hand drive vehicles are pretty nutty. Like it's really surprising that uh, that's the solution. I mean, I've seen a few right-hand drive vehicles here. Uh, I never thought about like how what, what they do in, in, in the right-hand drive markets. I assume that there are some people that already imports them because they're not, maybe not all versions are available, not all models are available in right-hand drive. 
Yeah, and and you know people take their cars from France to the UK all the time, and yeah. vice versa. So it's doable. It's sure. doable, but it's it's weird because it, it's not like Tesla had to invent a Model S that had a right side steering wheel. Like they had one, they were making them. The, the yeah. plans were all there. You know, <laughs> like it was. It's just weird that they uh, they were they selling it for the last two years with the refresh too. So it's not like right. the, it looks to me. It very looks like a last minute decision over the last few months where they were like, we have a pent up inventory here. Instead of just making a right hand drive version, can we just unload that on those markets? And then boom. Uh, it's a very likely explanation, in my opinion. Huh. Possible, uh, yeah. All right, we have one more uh, Tesla news before we jump into the non Tesla news. So if you guys have any questions, you can put them in the comment section right now. We're going to get to them in about uh, 20, 30 minutes. It can be a question about the subject that we're discussing today, or it can be a new subject in the EV space you want us to discuss, anything like that. Uh, yeah, this was a weird one that came out today that uh, really upset me. It's the um, the recall. So if you follow Tesla News, you've probably seen it everywhere this morning. It was picked up by all the big publication where they say that Tesla is virtually recalling all vehicles sold in China, uh, over a million of them due to a, uh, an issue. Like the, the, and that's where I take an issue with the, the news uh, over a problem. Uh, an, uh, an issue or a defect or problem that they're calling it with the brakes uh, when it has nothing to do with that. And, and just to, to clarify the situation, like I'm not, this is not one of those like, oh, should we call a recall or rec a recall when it's over the air update? It's not even about that. Like in this case, the recall is simply the update that we talked about last month that this is doing, bringing back the uh, low regenerative braking option. So, they are they, they did it in the US and it was not a recall in the US it was just there we're bringing back the this option but my understanding is in China because the update is like safety related to a degree because it affects like the, the driving features and uh, the low like people sort of request it because you could it could technically be safer in low and some driving con condition if it's slippery or whatnot. So because of that, they're making it a recall, but it's simply the software update that is bringing back a feature that Tesla used to offer in the past. They removed it for efficiency reason. They wanted to be people to just focus on driving on standard, but now they're bringing back the low feature. And because they're pushing that, the, the regulators in China made it through a safety recall. <laughs> and the all the media are picking it up. Like this is a, a big, like Tesla is fixing a defect in their car. Uh, on a million vehicle when it's simply an update that made it to the U.S. a month ago and now made it in China. It just it has to go through the, the recall process. That's it. It's literally a feature update. So I'm not, I, I put a, a tweet about it this morning because uh, I called out like Bloomberg, Rotters, The Verge, The New York Times. They all like reported this, like this is literally like the, that the, the Chinese regulators found an issue with Tesla vehicles and now this is fixing it through a software update. It's not that. It's not, it's not that at all. Yeah, kind of weak. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like uh, it's time for the auto industry to kind of forget about recalls and switch up to uh, software update required. Yeah, but that, that, that's the thing. For <laughs> this one, it's not even that debate. It's, it's more like... Right. It's more. It's a feature update. It's just that for the Chinese system, it has to go through that process. But it, it was the same thing in the U.S. a month ago, and no one reported on it in the U.S. So like, why are people reporting on it from China now? Because it went through that process. That's it. Uh, so it's it's just like poor work from from the media here, where the the they saw like oh, an opportunity to report on, on on Tesla like a recall. But if they knew what they were talking about, they would realize that this is just a feature update. Um, but they're not following this as closely as we are, obviously, which leads to, to these little mistakes. All right, moving on from Tesla, we have Honda unveiling a new poorly named SUV, electric SUV here, the ENY1. Would you pronounce this? With a colon. Yeah. yeah. It, it's like, how can we name something to, to not sell cars? 
Yeah, I mean, I thought at first it might be like a Chinese like SUV that they're gonna release, and then like they just put a name on, on uh, for like the global market or whatever. <laughs> and but this is actually like they unveiled it in Europe at an event in Germany, so this is gonna be an international uh, vehicle that they're gonna sell. So they release some specs here. Uh, I'm gonna put the screen back on so that you can see the image um, as long as it doesn't, it doesn't start going crazy. Not too bad. Yeah, not too bad. Looks a uh, little bit boring in my opinion. The front is, I don't know. Looks a bit like the uh, Neo SUVs in China, mm -hmm. I think. It uh, looks a bit like that. Uh, spec wise, we're looking at um, 150 kilowatts motor. They don't say uh, front, front wheel drive motor. Mm, okay. 68.8 uh, kilowatt hour battery pack for 256 miles, 412 kilometers of WLTP range. So on the EPA basis, you're probably looking at around 200 miles, I would think. Yeah. Uh, 10 to 80 percent in 45 minutes, so not the fastest charging here. Um, yeah, this is uh, this is coming to the European market later this year. Look, I mean, Honda is showing it's that it is a little bit behind when it comes to electric vehicles, and so this is their new generation platform, and it feels like a generation platform that has been on the market for a few years, really. Yeah, I mean that those are the same specs as the Chevy Bolt, really. Uh, yeah, you're right. Exactly, 150 kilowatt uh, motor is the exact same size as the Bolt. Uh, 256 miles of range. That's three less than the Bolt. And the 68.8 kilowatt hour battery is about three kilowatt hours more than the Bolt. So yeah, and and it's bigger a little bit than the Bolt. So you right. would assume like again like the, the range that you gave was the EPA one too. So right. You could expect a lot less range than that on the EPA base. So yeah, it's also going to be slower. Yeah, at least it, at least it charges a little faster. A little faster, but not super fast for yeah. for for like a 2024 SUV. That's going to be basically. Yeah, weak. Yeah, not 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 that big fan. All right, let's uh, let's jump into all. Uh, uh, stop sharing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's jump into all the, uh, the these earnings this week. So we like we like to follow them because uh, I mean these are all electric startups, and uh, the f the fact that if they can start to be financially sustainable business, like it's a good sign for the EV industry. Of course, Tesla already proved that to be possible, uh, and beyond that, but uh, they are they are the only ones so far to have done it in a long time. So Rivian is arguably the one that's closest behind, but we have had some problems with them in terms of achieving positive gross margins on their vehicles. So we already did, uh, reported that they delivered uh, about 8,000 units last quarter, um, produced a, a little bit fewer than 10,000. They said that they, they couldn't, that was few, fewer than the quarter before that, but that was apparently because of their van production line that was down for a little bit as they upgraded to their new drive units. Uh, but now we have the financials on that, and um, they posted revenue of $661 million. Um, gross profit fell to a negative of $535 million. So basically right now it costs them about twice as much as they sell them to to, to produce the, the vehicles um, and that that's before the the cost of operations and all that because when when you uh, when you, you include that they are losing one I cannot can I just zoom in on that um, sorry let me look they are losing um, loss for operation $1.5 billion a quarter right now. So they raised about that last quarter. So cash on end is flat at still $12 billion. So they still have some room to, to burn because <laughs> they're burning a lot right now. And we are seeing an improvement in the gross margin. It's still way in the negative. Um, but they still have until next year to turn that around and still survive. And that's their goal right now. They want to turn to a positive gross margin next year. But that again, that's a thing to keep in mind. Even once they turn positive gross margin, the 
profit is still not there. Like they're still gonna have a big loss. They need they need to have right now like a, a probably a first. Let me see. They have to like triple their sales and and get a twenty to thirty percent gross margin in order to compensate for the operation losses. So yeah, it's uh, we're still we're still pretty far from that. But Tesla was also pretty far from achieving uh, overall profit. So uh, we we keep comparing them with Tesla, but we're comparing them from Tesla when Tesla was still losing money. But at that time, Tesla was selling their car for a gross profit, which Riven is still not doing. Um, again, a little improvement. I I think the I'm starting to get a little bit more confident that it could get there uh, next year, uh, but. At the same time, the thing that's uh, confusing me right now is like part, we just got an email from them where they are delivering, they, they, you can deliver new cars in two weeks, a new R1 in two weeks for someone if that you place order, order now, right now. You get it, right. Yeah, so, so that's not super encouraging in terms of demand. Well, yes, on one hand, but the other, other thing is like people like you haven't gotten their original yeah. orders yet. So to me, it seems like they're prioritizing uh, people who are paying the higher price than uh, the, the original orderers who got the lower price, which like on one hand, as somebody who, you know, ordered early and got the lower price, I'm like, where's my freaking car? But yeah. on the other hand, I, they need to get their, you know, price per vehicle way up. So, you know, would, would you rather have the company survive and you get your car a little later? I don't know. I don't know if that's yeah. My my main concern is like okay, but if if they right now they can turn around the customer in two weeks, at, if if they are willing to pay that new price, which is about like twenty percent higher. Um. So the question is like, how much demand is there for Rivian vehicles at that higher price? Like right. over like already in a year. Like how has it been? Like a year and a half now that they've been in production. In a year and a half, they already worked through most of that. Uh, backlog of order then they still have some they still have some but like people or the people that are buying that is like because they're buying it because they have it at a lower price too so it's obviously also the timing of the market and then the price hikes right now the the interest rate hikes i think it's it's like six percent on the car right right now to do it so it's not it's not an ideal situation to buy a new car too like there's there's no doubt uh so that's not rivian's fault but so we need to look at does Rivian has significant demand at those prices. And that two weeks is not super encouraging. Yeah, maybe good news for them. Uh, we saw that Volvo actually pushed back their EX90 till next year. So people who are kind of banking on getting that instead of the Rivian are probably going to take the Rivian. Yeah, that is going to create some demand for the L1S for sure. Um, yeah, other than that, they reaffirmed their production for 50,000 units this year. So uh, the, the production seems to be stable, but they can, again, there's still some room to get some economies of scales there, but they're going to have to be some other cost cutting um, operations in order to bring that, to, to turn that gross margin positive. Next one is uh, Lucid. They, uh, they reported. Um, not the best uh, quarter ever. <laughs> uh, people were not super impressed. So uh, production uh, revenue one hundred fifty million dollars, but cost of revenue of a five hundred million dollars. <laughs> so over two, uh, so it's two point five times it caused them to produce uh, a lucid hair than they sell it for. Um, but again, that is an improvement over the same period last year, where it was uh, uh, over four times. <laughs> Like the cost of the the, the, sell, the sell price of the car, uh, they also rein in some of the revenue. They're selling and administrative revenue has been reined down by a significant amount, uh, so that's that's good news. But uh, they they still they're losing a lot of money. Uh, we're talking about seven hundred seventy two million dollars a quarter right now, and um, but they still have some decent cash on end to survive. Uh, let me see. They say that total liquidity at this time of four point one billion. So they are good for about a year right now without improvement. Obviously, we do expect improvement throughout this year, so that the survive they should survive a little bit more than a year. But they also need to turn things around pretty fast here. Uh, 
they don't have the same wiggle room as uh, Rivian, who has three times the cash. Right. Uh, they have three times the cash, and they're burning two times yes. faster. So. Yeah, Rivian certainly looks better if you look at the graph of pro you know mm -hmm. to get to profitability, and they think they can do that next year. That's and they've been the, Rivian's been fairly good at meeting their goals, you know, with their numbers. They haven't really exceeded their goals, but they're pretty good at hitting them sometimes. Well, not all, but their predictions are not bad. Uh, whereas uh, Lucid kind of seems like they might have some demand issues as well. Yeah, I mean, they have the pure version, the cheaper version coming later this year. Um, so that should help with demand, but is that going to help with the cost of, of like a, the gross profit still deep in the negative? Like if you're just selling more cars at a loss, it's just a bigger loss. It's not right. like it doesn't help that much. Um, and then they have the tri motor like Sapphire coming too. So like a lot of people are, are excited about that because this is like the, the plaid competitor, but Tesla has issues selling the plaid. So uh, it's not, it's not looking that good. Personally, like where, I've never actually drew, uh, tried the the Lucid yet. I, I wish I can because like right now the only thing is like, is the product really that good? On paper, it's good. It looks good, but this is a premium brand, and like that's that's the the problem with them is like premium brand without a name behind it. Like you know, BMW has Mercedes and all that. It's it's a harder sell. So I don't know if uh, how they fit in that premium segment right now. Yeah, and then Mercedes is coming out with like, uh, you know, really nice EQS. Uh, then there's the AMG version of the EQS, yeah. and now they have a Maybach version. So, yeah. uh, competition. Yeah, the Maybach is pretty well. Uh, all right, lastly, we're going to discuss also Fisker's earnings this week. And uh, this one's a little bit of a controversial one. Uh, the It was, uh, again, <laughs> we're not, not a ton of good news on the EV startup earnings front. So it was also bad news for, for Fisker. Um, they came in, uh, do we have like it right here? Uh, so revenue, well, okay, I was, <laughs> uh, so revenue came in at 198000 uh, dollars. So obviously, it's just a few units that they deliver. But the thing is, like, they produce fifty-five thousand units, but apparently, they still count some of them in the engineering units. So and, and marketing. So these, it's not cars that are selling to customer. Apparently, they only delivered two cars to customers, including one of them to uh, uh, Enric Fisker. And so and. So the, the only the good news here is like because they are producing these cars with um, Magna, they are already coming in at a profitable gross margin. Uh, so they made thirty five thousand dollars on those couple of cars. But uh, obviously, the problem with Fisker now, where they lose money, is like they are in charge of uh, uh, the, the the servicing, delivery, and all that, and they are still losing a decent amount of money, one hundred and twenty one million dollars last quarter. Um, now where things get a little controversial is like they're saying that they might have some issues delivering those Fisker uh, Bloomberg came out with a report saying that they are having issues with the first one that they was delivered in Denmark uh, to a customer they have to give it back right away they, they claim some things about the software being a problem and uh, limiting the speed of the vehicle which uh, Fisker denied but they did one of those denied that sounds like you know when you do a report and like you claim a lot of things in the report and uh, and then the company comes out like this is not true and then they say the thing that's not true but it's just one of the many things that was said in the report so uh, it, it sounds like they might be having a bit of an issue with the the, the first fiscal I, I, I would I would put more credibility on the Bloomberg side of thing than on the fiscal on this one uh, just to be safe so who's responsible for the software of those cars is that fiscal or is that Magna. Uh, well, I mean, this is the engineering part of things, and Fisker is supposed to do the engineering in the car. Uh, they were in partnership with Magna, mm -hmm. so I think I think it would be them. Um, yeah, the the other big thing that uh, slowed things down to that, that that was the bad news for Fisker is that they uh, revised down their production. So. 
Uh, the Automaker State Production is expected to ramp up beginning next week. I expect to produce between 1,400 and 1,700 Oceans in Q2, in the cinema, and the runway is 6,000 units monthly in Q in Q3. That's a lot. Um, so, okay, the annual guidance has been uh, went from 42,000 units to between 32 and 36. So that was the uh, the setback here. Uh, and so the, the big things we've been talking about, the burn rate and everything, so like 121 million for Fisker. But the thing with Fisker is that they have a lot less cash on it. So they have $652 million on it. So they have about just over a year, five or six quarter max, that they need to turn things positive. Now, if they can deliver more cars, that's going to be good for them because they have a positive gross margin thanks to Magna. Um, the thing, like the thing with Fisker, is, I just, I, I worry that the exact same thing that's gonna happen the last last time now, where all right, the the car gets popular, a bunch of people deliver it, but then it's just not working anymore for whatever reason. Like just a few, with with the kind of margin that they have right now on 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 cash of four between four and six quarters, basically that they have, like a few recalls could could change yeah. that whole thing up pretty quick uh, i don't i don't hope that's what's gonna happen i hope that it goes well but i wouldn't be surprised if we see something like that happening all right our last piece of news before we jump into the comment section is uh very interesting news it's uh the electric formula sun grand prix uh that uh is officially the new name of the competition because Seth took his checkbook out and uh, you can uh, I share the screen by the way I said yeah. and um, made us the official sponsors of the Formula Sun Electric Solar Core competition. Take it away. Yeah, Seth. super cool. Uh, so I've been a fan of this thing for a long time. I used to like uh, when they were racing across Australia. Um, this isn't that. That's like the world competition, but this is the U.S. competition. Although uh, there's some uh, international uh, schools, including uh, local one to you, Fred, in Montreal. I gave them some money to sponsor them to like. Nice, nice work. Specifically, you know, team. <clears throat> USC has a, uh, you know, my alma mater has a uh, solar team, and I was like, they got to be on the list somewhere, and they're not, and I don't know what's going on. Uh, I had, I had the. Uh, the like card they gave me around here somewhere, but anyway, uh, there's going to be 22 teams, and probably more. 22 have already like done the paperwork, so um, and this is you know happening pretty soon, uh, the end of June, so about a month and a half from now, um, in Kansas. Are you coming, Fred? Are you coming to Kansas? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to make it. I mean, yeah. Kansas in the end of June, that there's no better place to be. Yeah, uh, watering <laughs> hot in the middle of a racetrack. I was just only going to show off with some good SPF 50 and maybe in a unit umbrella. Well, I, I actually have some news that we haven't said publicly yet, but uh, Aptera is going to be there, which uh, we haven't finalized the detail, so they could still you know not make it. But mm -hmm. um, we're very close to announcing that. Um, they're it's a perfect match. Obviously, they have their yeah. their solar thing and the very uh, efficient stuff and. Uh, this is a very efficient solar thing, so uh, that'll be really cool. Um, it's it's a smart move. Like uh, in the the post, I I talked about how uh, Tesla co-founder JB Straubel um, got his start in this world um, at Stanford. Um, Tesla started with a bunch of people from the Stanford uh, um, solar team, solar car team. So. This is also a sponsor this year too. People don't know. Yes, they're not that, the name title sponsor right, like we right. are, but they are a sponsor. <laughs> and I hate to say this, but uh, that's unofficial because they haven't they haven't paid the money yet. So <laughs> <laughs> they're on. Um, they, they, but they probably will be there too. Like, uh, the, I hope so. I mean, what we were, what, like we were just saying, like one of the big thing is like hiring for those people. Aptera too should probably make an effort to try to hire some of these people because. Uh, they, they have some pretty good hands-on experience on making a solar car. Obviously not a uh, road legal car because this is going to be done on, on, on this uh, racetrack, but the same principles apply. 
Yeah, I mean, for as far as like recruiting, like everybody should be there. You know, I I pitched Rivian on on being at the show, and they're like, "Ah, oh, we can't do it. It's too much. You know, we don't have we don't have the um, enough time to put it together," which is understandable. They have other uh, priorities, but uh, you know, if I was an electric car company, I would I'd be at this thing already. Um, so you know, like uh, Lucid and even the big you know GM Ford. They should all they should all send people to interview yeah. these kids. Um, I mean, it, they're not even all kids. Like, there's a couple uh, like masters students, I think, on the uh, on one of the teams that are you know in their 30s. So um, it's pretty it's pretty good talent, and they're building pretty cool vehicles. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see that. And then you know, obviously, Aptera being there will be you know kind of interesting to juxtapose those you know, uh, the efficiencies of each vehicle versus like the most efficient car on the road. Mm -hmm. So a bunch of electric people are going to be there, yourself included, likely mm -hmm. me. And uh, so what, what can people do? Can people go and buy tickets? Like, uh, it's actually it's, it's actually free to watch. Uh, yeah. You're, you're uh, encouraged to donate to the, mm -hmm. the thing. Um, Heartland uh, Raceway is like a, a big racetrack. So there's all the amenities uh, that any you know NASCAR show would would have, I guess. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I haven't been there. I don't know the place, so. Um, but uh, you know, that's the video of JB talking about uh, his start in the. You know what's interesting to me is they they haven't really changed the design of these cars that much. Yeah. What has changed is like the solar panels are more efficient. The, uh, the inverters. The, the invert exactly inverters um, batteries are all a little bit better like I don't know what the uh, battery requirements are I think you know they get a little bit of a battery to to uh, you know when the sun goes away but um it's just a really cool project uh, it's something I've always mm -hmm. like been super interested in and um, and another thing is uh, that company Lightyear that is you know not having the, the best financial Time right now also came out of one of these kind of events. It was a, I think, a Dutch team that um, won the uh, Sedan World Challenge or whatever, and then they decided to evolve that car into the Lightyear One and 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 their subsequent cars. Yeah, super cool project. The Electric Formula Sun Grand Prix. It's coming up. June 27th through July uh, 2nd at the Heartland Motorsport Park in Topeka, Kansas. We're going to see you there, everyone. We're going to remind you over the next month uh, um, just to be sure, but uh, it's a cool little project. And now we jump into your questions. Let's do it. All right. I hope you've been reading up on Cattle. Question. <laughs> Cattle has announced a new condensed battery. With 500 watt hours per kilogram, which it says will go into mass production this year, will this revolutionize the EV space? So we talked about this before, and mm -hmm. uh, so they, they specifically said that they're going to target the um, air travel with this. And uh, so I I know where you're going from, where, you, where you're coming from, Glenn. With this is like, oh, I mean, obviously this kind of energy density can also be useful for land transport. Thing is, like they didn't mention the cost or anything like that, or longevity or all that. So, uh, well, the longevity they did release some some uh, data that looks promising, but the the cost is a big one, obviously, and um, it's less so of an impact on air travel because the fuel consumption is such a big part of uh, of the cost of per mile of, of air travel. So you, you can get that. Uh, from 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 that part of the budget here, um, but the fact that they folk they said specifically that this is going to aim at the uh, at electric planes basically would tell me that maybe this is not going to be something that's going to be used in electric cars. It is impressive though, uh, 500 yeah. watt hours per kilogram. If you multiply both sides by 100, you get 50 kilowatt hours. Is 100 kilograms, so that's like the weight of a a person, big person. Uh, and you get enough battery to to run a car, you know, like the low end of uh, electric car batteries. So we're talking about, and you know, obviously this will get less expensive. And uh, so we're talking about batteries that not only is it a lot lighter, you know, 
100 kilograms is really light, but you know, that starts to make things like modules that you could put in your trunk or, mm-hmm. or other use cases. So that's pretty cool. I like, I like to see this kind of stuff. Yeah. It's, Cattle- it's for sure going to get, get less expensive over, over time. It's just that I think as, as this happened through a focus on uh, hair travel, I, I think maybe like some of the technologies maybe is going to trickle down to EVs, but it's probably going to be some kind of mix of like, uh, oh, we can use this aspect of this battery to improve that. But uh, at the end of the day, the cost is the biggest one, the cost per kilowatt hour. Like the, the energy density for ground vehicles, it's already figured out in batteries. Like we can right. make like super long range EVs if you want to. It's just more of a, a cost thing. Uh, but yeah, if you want to make a super efficient EV, though, like you can make that into like a super a super car that's super efficient. That could be cool where money is not an, uh, a problem. Yeah, cattle's really like been hitting it out of the park lately. They, oh, you know, sure. with the LFP batteries, um, which are the lower density uh, side of the spectrum, but cheap and have some other, you know, can charge them all the way and they more cycles. Because um, we see a lot of like people like claim these super high energy density batteries, and most of the time we're like, all right, all right. But when CATL say that, you're like, oh, okay, like this this right. one might be <laughs> might be a real one. They have some credibility. Let's just say that. Right. They. I mean, they have a lot of credibility. They're they've been doing really well, and they're the biggest yeah. battery producer out there. So, uh, Joy Lynn King says, "What is the production goal for GM and Ford EV this year?" So first of all, GM and Ford will never tell you what their production goals are. They, uh, in fact, they they will berate you for even asking. But F- uh, Ford did say that the annual production capacity. Well, okay, so you're saying production goal and annual production capacity? Then, yeah, it's. I mean, they they have you know goals, but they don't mm-hmm. have like the the actual like numbers. They will yeah, well, they, they don't say how many necessarily they're going to produce this year. But Ford, at least, has been clear that they want to get to six hundred thousand cars and a, a, an annual production capacity year. of. Uh, oh, that's next year. I think twenty twenty four. I thought it was by the end of this year. You know what? It so it, at the end of this year they want to be at a six hundred thousand yeah, car saying, yeah. run rate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're not going to build six hundred thousand this year, but yeah, gonna, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. So yeah, December thirty first this year. You know they're going to make enough cars if they made one every every day. GGM is going to be interesting because uh, I don't think they've said, but obviously they're going to have uh, the Equinox by the end of this year. It's going to be like, so it's, it, I guess it's highly dependent of like how quickly they can rim that up. Um, the Silverado is this year too, right? So, yeah, but the Silverado is only going to be for fleets um, yeah. in, in the spring. And then uh, I think in the fall or even like the end of the year, they're going to have uh, consumer versions. Yeah, so so it really depends on how fast they can ramp up Equinox and Silverado because the rest is like it's peanuts, like the, the Cadillac Lyric and uh, Hummer EV and all that. And obviously, uh, well, I mean, technically the well seventy thousand bolt because the <laughs> we already forget about the bolt because it's dead, but it's dead at the end of the year. They're still in production right now, so they still plan to produce about seventy thousand of them, I think. Yep, and uh, those will all be sold before they even be are mm-hmm. made. So probably not that much more than that, I would say. I mean, even like even with a good ramp up of the Equinox, a good ramp up of the Silverado, maybe twice as much, maybe one hundred fifty thousand. It's so low for GM, such a big company. I know. Twenty twenty three, if they produce only one hundred fifty thousand EVs, well, oof. but they're gonna have a production capacity for probably. Well, I mean, you cut the bolt again from it for next year. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, they they really have to like. You know, they, they keep saying, like, we're all in on EVs. Well, just, like, how come when I go to a EV a GM dealership, there's no EVs there? Like, mm-hmm. you're not all in on EVs until, until yeah. the dealerships are full of EVs. All right. Uh, Canoe is up to 17,000 pre-orders. Individuals can pre-order with $100 refundable, like Cybertruck. Do you think they can deliver and be successful? Honestly, I don't follow Canoe too closely. We'd have to ask uh, Scooter for that. I think Scooter is the one primarily carving Canoe. And I don't know where they are at in terms of the production. I mean, 17,000 pre-orders uh, It's with a $100 refundable deposit. It's not a giant commitment. So I wouldn't... Uh, and a lot of people are like... like I think my parents have like three or four different EVs on order right now. They're just 
waiting like the first one that he, he can get so a lot of people are doing that um and uh, yeah i don't see a giant like differentiating factor of can okay, obviously the, the design is is not like anything else you've seen but other than that right. it's uh I don't, I don't see any kind of things that may, makes them unique I, again the design is unique but like who cares <laughs> right now some people yeah car people sometimes care i'm just curious yeah, yeah though. but I'm, I'm just saying like you cannot if it's just that if it's just right. like look how weird we look like it's just, maybe some people like it but then right they're not cheap either so like we would it's hard for an unknown brand to uh for people to 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 make a big purchase like that it's not easy i'm curious uh you said your parents have a uh put down money on a few evs which one which ones are they looking at well they just put down on equinox uh, speaking of Interesting. Uh, and then before that they had the id4 uh but i think uh, i think the id4 i don't know if they gave up the id4 yeah, the Ionic 5 and ID4, they gave up one of them uh, because I think it, it, it didn't work with the uh, federal tax credit anymore. Or oh, uh, not the tax credit, but the federal uh, incentive that we have. For the, uh, the federal of, or the provincial ones. I don't know which one didn't work on one of them. Gotcha. All right. Uh, uh, front wheel drive is terrible in electric vehicles. Poor uphill switchback traction. Um, was actually... Honda. Yeah, I actually agree with that. Uh, I have a Chevy Bolt with front-wheel drive, and uh, going up hills and slippery stuff, I often spin the wheels. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't. I mean, there's just too much torque, and uh, the the whole point of front-wheel drive is it's over a very heavy engine, and the he the weight of a EV is in the middle with the battery. So, um, I think rear-wheel drive works a little bit better. Obviously, you know, not for everything, but. All right, uh, Glenn Stanford, uh, the UK is a good market for the SNX. Left-hand drive won't sell here. Could be a big mistake. How big of a market, though? I think, think I saw some numbers, and uh, I think there's no more than like 12 or 15 or 20,000 MLS uh, in the last like 10 years since they've been delivering them. So not a huge market. UK is a decent market for Model Y and Model 3, though. Yeah, it's. I mean, it, it's a lot of people, and there's a lot of rich people there. So, um, Josh Ash asks, "What happened to the Saudis buying them out?" I think he's referring to Lucid. Um, I don't. Well, it's not buying them out outright. They have a large investment in them. Um, so I guess some people are find that reassuring, More like bailing say, like, them out. Yeah. So, like, if they keep. If, if 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 they keep needing some money, the Saudis would probably take them over. I think. All right. Question: Does that mean I won't get my right-hand drive Cybertruck launch day reservation? Uh -oh. <laughs> well, I mean, Glenn, I'm sorry, but if you're in the UK, you, whether you have a launch day reservation or not on the Cybertruck doesn't mean much. You're gonna get it whenever they get there, and they, if you get a Cybertruck before 2026. In the UK, I'd be presently surprised. All right, we have a French question from Facebook. That means that's you. Yeah. What What is the actual fortune of Elon Musk? Please. Yeah. Who cares? That's my, that's my answer. <laughs> Sorry. All I right. I, he's like, hey, 100, 100, 200 billion. Who cares at that point? Uh, Carl in San Diego, are you providing video coverage of the solar competition? There will be video coverage. For sure, um, if it's not broadcast or streamed or whatever, we'll we'll um, we'll do some streams and stuff. Yeah, and, we could uh, do something on the YouTube channel, electric YouTube channel. We could for sure. So and then uh, I can Aaron be a commentator. Or... I can be like a. I can, nice, I've yeah. been watching some F one. I can be like some kind of like it's a slow race too. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> got plenty of time to remember yeah, the names. Can, uh, they'll have to have a fast reaction time on this one. <laughs> no, they go like 40, 50 miles per hour sometimes. All right. We'll see. We'll see. Depends on how sunny it is. If it's yeah. cloudy, it's <laughs> going to be a slow raise. Uh, Bartholomew uh, request. Convince me into convincing my aunt to buy a full EV versus a plug-in hybrid. She currently has a hybrid and I have a Bolt. Go. 
uh why have two drive trains when you only need one and yeah clearly electric it's more complicated uh maintenance is gonna be it's gonna be bigger and i mean you have a bolt already so you can you can, you can tell her like because the one the biggest thing for people especially if they, she's already has an hybrid and she's thinking about a plug-in so that's would tell me that's some kind of people that uh, they have um they have issues seeing themselves as being an ev owners it's like it's too different for them like the charging and all that uh so obviously you know your end situation better than us like i don't know if she has a garage a driveway and all that because that obviously makes a huge difference for electric vehicles let's be honest about that um and then you have a bolt so you can tell her look i have one i've been having one for how many, how many months how many years and it's actually makes my life easier because i wake up every morning with a full charge or whatever is a situation or your situation like there's uh that's generally where i go at because most people at this point like know okay this is going to be the future they just have some issues like all right how does my day-to-day -day life look like as an ev owner versus uh having to go to the gas station and as an EV owner, you can you're in a good position to explain just how much easier that is. Yep. And then we have some conversation there. Hybrids burn gas, and you still have to change the oil. That's true. Uh, asking about uh, your parents' Equinox pre-order, I think. So they ask only in Canada. I think some uh, Chevy dealers are taking orders. Yeah, I think it's with the dealers. They, they reached out to a dealer. Yeah, they say that, you know. We'll give you the first one we have or second one or whatever. And then they, of course, lie to you or whatever. <laughs> yeah. It's no guarantees. Right. Uh, since more EV owners don't have access to home charging, any thoughts on the orange outlet that provides level one and two smart outlets with billing solutions? I'm thinking of multi-unit apartments and condo. Uh, that sounds like something I should know about. Yeah, the orange outlet. I have no idea what that is. Um, but it's a solution for condos because we've seen already a bunch of solution for condos. Yeah, it sounds like um, I'm getting like a a, a mall. Yeah, I got it. A too. mall in Orange County. All right, uh, it's called OrangeCharger.com, and it looks like just wiring for. Oh yeah, I see it now. No, there, there, we are. There are there are some solutions like, like that for for properties. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it can be an issue for sure. Um, but you have to talk to, if you, if it's an apartment and if you have charging, uh, parking in, in this apartment, you have to talk to the the managers, the, the, the property managers, and or if it's a condo unit like the, the HOA, and um, tell them, like, the future is electric, and if you want this... Uh, property to stay a uh, modern time to survive modern times like you have to have charging solutions and you, you can look it up i'm not too familiar with this orange charger thing but i know there's there's starting to be quite a few solution now that can make uh, billing easy and uh, make charging like to, to associate the charging with each unit because i know like in parking garage of big buildings and things like that it can the, the Electricity costs for like things like the shared area, like a garage or the lobbies and all that. That it, it's hard to 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 like split that energy cost between the units if someone consumes more than the other. But uh, there are solutions right now for that. Yeah, I'm just looking at it real quick. Um, it's a pretty cool thing. It's got a little uh, RFID or not RFID, the a little um, uh, 3D uh, scan, and then a a 20 amp uh 240 volt plug which means that you know 20 20 amps means that you can use your our existing wiring so it's kind of it's kind yeah. of a cool thing we'll have to look into it moving on uh i'm suspicious of ev production delays being more to do with negative profitability can you report on the industry profitability issue at companies too many folks assume profitability I, mean, it's kind of I don't know that, that many people assume profitability. I think like we just we just discussed it just now. Like uh, we just discussed the earning of three EV startups that are losing money, and there's no doubt that Ford is also losing money. Is uh, on the vehicle GMs like this? They're just they're also in the same boat where they're just starting to ramp up and they're making huge investments in these big factories to produce them. And when these factories produce at low capacity, it's not it's not good. Um, 
it is it is a problem. Uh, I don't know if it, it's certainly not the only problem. The supply chains are still very real problems for automakers right now, especially in the EV industry. And uh, the all the way down to the minerals, like we're gonna need more lithium, we're gonna need more nickel, we're gonna need more cobalt, we're gonna need more manganese, we're gonna need more uh, copper. Really, uh, there's, there's there's a lot of that happening, and um, we we are in this awkward phase right now. Like in the 2023 to 2025, like it's gonna be a really awkward phase, but uh, you, you're gonna see things happening in 2025 and up, unless there's some major like economic downturns and all that. Uh, I, I think. 2025, you're going to see so many successful, high volume EV programs out there um, that um, that it's going to change the game completely. Like you, people are going to see, okay, that's that's the way to go. Because right now, like there's the Model Y and there's the Model Three. These are like the two like high volume global EV programs out there. The rest is like a much lower volume. Or it's localized, like in China, you have some decent programs, but it's just in China, and obviously that comes with some uh, different standards. But once you have like Model Y programs from like two or three different companies out there, and like four or five, six different models, uh, the Cybertruck and the F one fifty next generation that makes like a million units a year, and all that, that that's that's the end of the uh, combustion engine right there. Who's the next company to get to profitability on their EVs? Like something like well, Hyundai? Volkswagen has been Volkswagen. has been very focused on that. I think so. Uh, Volkswagen is it's just like a lot. A lot of the companies are still chasing this uh, the, the the subsidies and all that. So that's right. that that's been a, a problem where like the plans keep changing. Like oh, the U.S. did their protectionist move of uh, North American manufacturing of batteries and U.S. production and all that. So people like had to change their plans and everything, but yeah, I think Volkswagen is a is a good one. Um, Ford is gonna get there pretty fast too, I think. But they, I think they need their next generation, so I think it's gonna be like twenty twenty five. Mm -hmm. um, BMW, yeah, BMW. Uh, I mean, they, they they don't go cheap BMW, so right. <laughs> it's easier for them to to do that. But they're still not very high volume, so I want I want to see high volume. Yeah. Uh, Glenn Stanford, 2026. I might get it before the FSD I paid for. <laughs> oh, I mean, man. You're in the UK and you paid for FSD too. That's that's a bummer. Like You won't see much of that happening for a while still. Uh, yeah, and then BMW and then group getting spun up this year. Yeah, I think you're going to see some some spin-off, some consolidation happening. I think you're going to see a lot of that in the industry in the next few years. Um yeah, I mean, we still we still laugh at Toyota. Like they just they, they say something in the corner of the mouth, and something else in the other corner, and all that. Like you're, you're gonna see a lot of that just dying away in the next two years, and uh, people are gonna have to have some like big realization because when you have billions and billions, billions and billions of assets linked to production of an internal combustion engine, uh, and and you finally realize that it's going away a lot faster, like it's uh. It's a bad day at the office. Really. Yeah. <laughs> a bad day at the office. All right. Well, thank you everyone for listening to the Electric Podcast this week. We appreciate every single one of you. If you do enjoy the show, there's a few things you can do to help us out. You can just put a like on this video if you do like it. That helps a lot. You can subscribe and hit the notification button to know when we're going live next time. But if you're not aware, it's every Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. And uh, if you're listening on your podcast app right now, and uh, we appreciate you too. And if you can give us a five star rating on your app, that helps us show a lot too. Free to do takes a second. And we appreciate every single one of you that does it. Uh, thank you. Have a safe weekend. Bye bye.